Okay, so uh, it's so wonderful to be in here with all of you. And thank, really, I wanted to thanks to QP and PSAC and MSN to uh, make this tour really happen because we have been talking like last few months on it and our schedule is not, not like matching. So I'm kind of back and forth to the States and this is really a great timing. Uh, to be in here when all this, uh, you know, union having their uh, conventions. <coughs> so uh, I'm from a country. Now you all know where is Bangladesh is, and there is few reasons uh, to know Bangladesh. Uh, so if any of you raise your hand, if you know Bangladesh and why it is. Oh, cool. Okay, <laughs> back. Tell me. Well, I've, I've, I've visited Bangladesh about five times. Oh my gosh, great. It's so bad that I, it is first time in Bangladesh, for, sorry, Canada for me. I should come more often. And you already said that you were in Bangladesh. I was yeah, that in Bangladesh twice. Wow, wow. Is one more hand, any of, yeah, please. I lived there in 1989. Wow, that's great, wonderful to know. Okay, it is so, I'm, I'm so glad any of them you not been said that it is because of Rana Plaza. Okay, <laughs> because there is many people saying, I know Bangladesh because of Rana Plaza and disaster. Okay, so yeah. So yes, the country I'm from who make clothes for you and we are really connected because we are at the bottom of supply chain with all the skills to making clothes. And you are here in the top of the supply chain with the you know, purchasing power that you have. And now I'm here going to connect you with the ground situation. And later in this evening, when we'll finish our talk, we can decide how we can work together and make changes. There is no doubt we need, need the change, so we need to figure it out how we can do that. So before we go there, I think I should talk more about what is the working condition look like, how much our workers make, and maybe I can add some of my personal experience and also um, what's going on globally and locally aftermath of Rana uh, to prevent this death toll. So this is, uh, I'm going to talk. So we have four million workers working in Bangladesh in the garment industry. And over 85% of them are female workers. They're so young and no doubt this industry helped them to get these jobs and just to know or just to understand what is the economic freedom is. But in the same time, it, it has put them in a death trap factories as well as in the below poverty line. So our workers making today it is December 5th. Today, even their salary is $38 for per month, which is minimum wage. And it, two weeks back, there is a, a rise has given, and that's going to be a $68 for per month, which is, is still going to be a poverty wage. Workers was demanding $100 for per month, and that was they saying it has to be minimum. So the workers are looking for above hundred dollars because without that it is so difficult for a person to live with that money and more difficult if person has two kids in the family. To provide a 10 to 20, uh, 12 feet room, they need to spend $25. So you can imagine that what is the living cost look like there. Um, the workers who work at the factory is still uh, they need to face all these verbal and physical abuses for minor mistakes. They don't have safe for drinking water at the factory. They cannot enjoy their sick leaves, uh, uh, you know, earned leaves, which is entitled. Uh, the workers, uh, you know, they need to face all this even, sometimes they've been even slapped in the production floor because of minor mistake. They need to go through all this excessive production target. Uh, excessive production target, like a t-shirt you can make uh, per hour a uh, 60 to 80 pieces, but they, they would pressure you to make it 100 to 100, 20 or 150 pieces, which is excessive. And it is so difficult for them to meet that. And if they can't meet, sometimes they lose their overtime pay. So it is 10 to 12 shower, 
you know, shift hour is very common, six days in a week. Sometimes they need to work even seven days. And sometimes workers also wanted to do the overtime, though overtime it is voluntary, but workers are forced to do that. And they want to do it. When I say that sometimes they wanted to do it, it's because uh, they really wanted to make some extra money so they can add with their salary to live uh, with that money. Okay, so th as they don't have any other choice. So these long shifting hours just killed their social life. So, you know, in average, work f if workers work at the factory five to eight, hour eight years, after that, they don't want it to keep doing these jobs because it is so tiring. So then they prefer to move, maybe migrate themselves in the Middle East or go back to the country you know, doing the agriculture jobs. So that is happening. And in terms of safe working place, we all know uh, that is the factory is unsafe. When you see these all big headlines um, about Tajreen fire, which has killed 112 workers and Rana Plaza, which has killed over 1,100 workers. But many of you, maybe you thinking that this might be a new uh, fire or only one fire at the factories in Bangladesh or a, only one disaster, but that's not the case. The fire and the factory collapse is nothing new. It is started two decades back. It's just not killed 1134 or not 112. It has killed many thousands. So the factory fire we had even back 1990 uh, that has killed workers, including a factory owner. The, the reason was the doors was locked. The factory was a death trap factory. There was only one stair. Uh, the half of that was blocked by merchandise. And 24 years later, when you hear about the Tajreen fire and the workers, the death toll you see or you saw, you heard, the reason was the doors was locked. So the nothing has been changed or the stakeholders like the company, factory owner and the government haven't done anything to correct this situation without saying always that this is a wake up call for us. Every time it's a wake up call, but they never wake. So in, we do have freedom of association rights that in the piece of paper. We do have pretty good law, which is not comply or enforce at the factories. Uh, whenever workers try to organize union, they are being threatened, beaten, fired, falsely charged. We have 5,000 factories, just garment factories across the country, where we have less than 100 union registered, which is real, and less than 20 of them who has a collective bargaining agreement with their factory owners. And just to give you another fact that just last, uh, since 2005 to 2013, the factory fire and collapse has killed over 1,800 workers. And over 1,200 just happened November 2012 uh, to November 2013. So that's, you know, that is the, just a sense that I'm trying to giving you uh, where we are today. <coughs> And my work, it is, you know, more connected because I worked at the factory. I started working at the factory when I was 12 years old. And I went to factory with my 10 years old brother because my father was only one uh, earner at the family and he got ill. He couldn't bring food in the table. And my mom, uh, she had to take care of my baby sister, so she had, had to stay at home. So this is two of us who was bringing food for seven at the home. Um, the working condition was worse than this, what we have today. I, I had to work in the sweatshop factory. I had to work 14 to 16 hour shift, what was so common, uh, seven days in a week. And I was making $6 per, per month, working over 450 hours. And that I had to go through because I didn't know how many hours I have to work. Nobody told me, nobody taught me that. Neither government nor the factory owner, nobody. So that was like ongoing. There was a lot of kids was working in those days. Uh, 
I would believe that they had to work because the parents didn't pay enough to send their kids to the school. So they had to bring their kids to the factory and you know, uh, working together and bringing food for all of them. And one point I wanted to make go for further that the wages I used to get $6 and the workers today, they're getting 38 or going to get 68. It is still a poor salary than my time because the cost of living is so high today. There, this wasn't the situation in my time. The cost was living was under control and we could live, barely could live with that money. It was, it was still poor, but not was the uh, situation like today. So then, um, without even knowing law, we went for a strike in the factory because management decided to pay us less uh, for our overtime pay. And we said, no, 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 you cannot do that. We went to strike and we won the strike. Uh, but 20 of my colleague, co-workers, who, uh, who got fired because of that strike. So these folks was trying to find a organization where they can go and you know, uh, find some legal aid support to sue the factory owner and because they were smarter than me. So <laughs> they got found and where they found also that organization helping workers to uh, you know, know the law and rights. And they, these folks came back to us and say that, hey, there is a, you know, a law class is happening in that uh, organization. Well, you should go. And I said, what is that? Okay, so one week later, along with my co-workers, I've been there. It was four hours class I was sitting. And whatever they said, I was like drinking. So these four hours changed my life. It was like completely changed my life. So what I consider it's a second burn. <laughs> because you went through the sweatshop and you didn't know, then you know what to do. And then I also learned that I, I have right to organize union. I can have collective bargaining in my factory if I have majority of members. So then I started uh, organizing co my coworkers and we got majority of the members and we submitted the union application. Unluckily that has been rejected. So in the age of 15, I become a union president in my shop floor. And age of 16, I got fired and blacklisted. The reason was I sued my factory owner because they fired me. So I sued them in the labor court and sued the government because they rejected our union application and sued both of them in ILO Geneva because they did unfair labor practice. They did violated ILO 80 core, uh, core convention at 87 and 98, which is right to organize, right to bargain. And that really made them mad. Yeah. So. <laughs> They just blacklisted me across the industry and made my life difficult. I didn't got job anywhere. You know, I didn't laugh in those days. <laughs> those was really bad days for me. I couldn't bring food in, in the table for my brother and sisters. So I didn't stop. That didn't stop me, that they made my life miserable and I don't have job. So what I have, I was looking for a job, but I was lucky that I have been picked up, picked up by the union said that you can be a good organizer. So I, I started you know, uh, working with the union as a union organizer and labor educator. And since then, I'm going on and on. And I'm making trouble in everywhere I can. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the starting. So I left the organization in uh, the union in 1999. And we, uh, three of us, three of, to, uh, two of my co-worker, co-colleague, or co-worker, whatever, and me, we found from this organization called Bangladesh Center for Worker Solidarity. It's a labor educator NGO. It's a kind of like helping hand of uh, unions because it's, you know, when I said that we have less than 100 union among 500, 5,000 factories. So it's, I think, giving you a sense that it's a union busting country. So it is not only for the garment workers, it's from, a, you know, else industry. Workers cannot organize union. So, so in our center, we are helping workers to giving all those law classes that I had that changed my life because it's a dream that I wanted to ch make change other lives too. So we do a, a couple of kinds of training to the workers and we have some special training for female workers as well because majority is the female. 
We have legal aid services, which is very important because workers got fired frequently or often, I should say. Um, and uh, they need to sue the factory owner for reinstatement or their back wages or their severances. So we help them to sue the, the, uh, the factory owner in the labor court. Uh, and we have educational program for uh, uh, workers, which is we call adult literacy, because majority of these workers hadn't had chance to complete uh, primary education like me. So uh, we are helping them to, uh, you know, have uh, that education. So we are helping them to learn Bangla, math, and basic English. And English is so important for them because, you know, if all these brand or uh, companies they have their own code of conduct and CSR. So to comply with those or to make sure those uh, to make sure those COC are being enforced at the factory, they send their own hiring auditors, and these auditors speak English, and translator is the factory manager. <laughs> so our workers cannot say even how much they really get paid by the factory. So we are like helping workers to learn all those sentences that auditors use during their visit, so they can reply them hey, I don't make $60, I make 40. This is the reality. So we are helping them to learn that. So we also have some educational program for their kids. We have a model daycare center, which is um, you know, to increase the female workers' voice to have a operational daycare center at their workplace because it is entitled, but it's not enforced. And we do have a couple of kind of uh, campaign that we run. Two of them are so important. One is uh, to raising the minimum wage, because as I said, that workers are really making poverty wages. So we ran this campaign in 2006, when uh, the minimum wage was like 13 or $14. So workers was asking $50 raise, but the government has considered 23. And we ran same campaign in 2010, when minimum was, was $23, and workers was asking 71 and the government gave raise 30, 38. And this year, we, are supporting, we were supporting workers' voices uh, to have a raise for $100, where the you know, raise came with $68. So it is like the country with a rest to bottom, they wanted to keep wages low in the world so they can compete in the international market and attract these multinational corporation to bring business in the country. So, that I think, uh, and, and the other piece of the campaign we done, it, it is nationally and internationally, uh, which is have a safe working place, and no doubt you all know that it is so important. Um, so nationally, we're running this campaign with the other uh, other organization, and globally, um, in the you know with the global unions and the activist group, uh, labor advocates group, or NGOs, and the campaign we're running. Now this time we are saying that we need safe working place, but in the same time we are saying that these companies need to take responsibilities to make this factory safe. And we, uh, you know, globally we're running this campaign since 2011. And what we are calling, we are calling to company to sign in an agreement, which now we call a court. So it was previous a agreement which says that company will take responsibility to make this factory safer and they will pay for necessary repair and intervention. So we hadn't had good luck until 2012. So there is only one company signed on this accord in back 2012, uh, which is called, fact, a company called PVH, Flips Van Huynson. They uh, won the logo called Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger, they're from US. And second company who signed on, it is called Chivo from Germany. So that's it. And then, you know, Tazreen fire happened. Situation provoked to uh, push, uh, put more pressure to the companies. And just right after that, Rana Plaza collapsed. So that has given us a extreme energy to put more and more pressure to the, this company because they were responsible for this death toll. If they would sign this accord even back 2011, Tazreen would not happen. Turana workers uh, would not die at the factory. We could even save these lives, these over 1,200 lives, but they didn't. So then we put a deadline with global unions that 15 May 2013 is your day to sign on. If you don't, we are coming with, coming to we, I mean to you. 
So I think this make them something different. This Rana Plaza really provoked and they understood that consumers group across the globe, they're really getting a different message that these companies really not doing what they're supposed to do. So then they started signing. Now today, we have over 110 companies who signed this accord. Majority is from Europe. We have Japanese company, one or two. We have co six or more we have from states, and we have only one from Canada. This is not only one company from Canada who sourcing clothes from Bangladesh. There are many of them. This is only Loblo Joe Fresh who signed this accord, and they had to sign because they were one of the sourcers from Rana Plaza. We found their clothes at the rubble in the Rana Plaza. So we had to make them shame through the medias, mm -hmm. and that helped, and they signed on. And why we are talking about this accord? Why we have to have this accord? There are a few reasons, of course. One first reason that in the history, this is first time, this much of company signed a document with union. That never happened. So we have two global union, industrial and uni global, who is the international uh, signatory, and then we have a local union who signed this accord along with global unions. This is the first document has been endorsed by whole European Union, every country, by UN, by ILO, by OECD, and all these reported uh, organizations. Second, it says workers will be in the board, will be in the table to tell how they feel safe at the factory and how to make factory safer. Third, it says a court, it will appoint its own independent inspector to inspect the factories in a three way, structural, electrical and fire. The traditional audit or inspection, which is doing by the government and by the um, companies, it's not helping. We know that. We have 200 inspectors to inspect over 400,000 shops, restaurants, factories, everything, all entities. First, this human resource not enough for this big industry. Second, they are not honest. And third, even they want to be honest, they can, cannot be. Why I'm coming? Okay. <laughs> In other hand, this company, the auditors they hired, they pay them. So we can, we can see that how uh, this audit can be happened. And they have like all this bunch, you know, a piece of paper with the checklist, benchmark, and it's just check, check, check. Everything is fine in this factory. That really audits happening. And moreover, these audits never been unannounced. It is announced, so factory management get enough time to coach workers on what to say. And, and other part I said that they speak English, where our workers barely can read Bangla. Okay, so another part of this accord is, it says when an inspection done, as per an inspect, inspector recommendation or as per the recommendation of these inspection, inspectors, the company will, the factory need to be do a repair and intervention and company will pay for that. That's never happened. Other, other good, other fundamental stuff in the accord is that workers will have right to refuse dangerous work. That's, we don't have even in the law. And few step ahead, it is legally binding. So all this company who signed on this accord, if they fail to comply or and you know uh, comply all those standards or enforce all those standards, they can be sued in their native country. So this time, this company will afraid of. So we have only um, Loblo has signed, but other piece. To defeat this document, there is a 26 North American retailers had brought up another piece of papers which is called Alliance. And it is led by Walmart, our friend. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
wall matter and gap is leading it and we have few Canadian, not few, majority of Canadian company who signed on including Hudson Bay. Children Place is one of the company who is with the alliance and this alliance piece knowing not going to work because it doesn't say workers will be in the table, it doesn't say uh, they, they will have their uh, independent uh, inspector, it doesn't say that they will pay for a necessary repair and intervention, it is not binding. It is not legally binding. So if it is not binding, then it is another piece of paper like their COC and CSR, which has completely failed to save this worker's life. So we don't want that one. We really want this accord to sign, sign by uh, these companies. So another one is this company, uh, many of them, they still uh, owe full and fair compensation to the workers at Rana and Tajrin, which has they now not been paid yet. I'm coming there with the ask. Before I go there, I just wanted to share other piece that for us, it is not too easy to continue all this work that we do. They just, the company, uh, sorry, the factory owners and the government not just uh, let us free to do all this. They didn't never say, oh, you are good, doing great jobs. Keep, keep doing this. No, that's not the case. So just to helping workers to raise their awareness and you know, uh, supporting their voice to minim for minimum wage and safe working place, the government cracked down us in 2010. First, they revoked our registration, legal status. So we cannot operate and all our fund does collapse. You don't, if you don't have legal status, you cannot have fund. And without fund, we cannot run. Second, when we didn't stop, we were keep doing our work, then government and the factory owners brought 11 different criminal charges against me and my co-workers and other union, act, uh, union organizers or union leaders. I, then I got arrested with my colleagues, was in prison for 30 days. At the interrogation cell, they interrogated me 18 hours in a row. And one of my co-workers severely beaten, and he he was uh, conf he had to confirm that he will not do union organizing. But luckily, he is still doing that. Okay, so we got released after tremendous international pressure from this part of the world, from Europe, U.S., and Canada. Even 19 uh, congressmen from U.S. they sent a letter to the Bangladeshi government to release us. We release on bail, but still we are facing a couple of those charges. We had to, last three years we had to be in the court every three days, so, and we had to spend like at least 70 hours per month uh, at the court, which really prevented us our real work that we do for workers. And that did not finish. This is not end. In 2012, they killed my one of colleague. I mean, Ul Islam, he's one of the organizer of our organization. He disappeared after his work shift at the center. And next morning, his body has been found at 100 kilometers away uh, from the place he disappeared. He has brutally tortured and beaten to death. And every single evidence pointing out to the national security intelligence officials uh, they can be backed by the factory. I'm not here to, you know, blame whole institution, the National Security, Intel, uh, uh, security Intelligence Institution. There can be like few people who also uh, arrested and intimidated him in back 2010. This can be same people who killed him. So, but everyone knows who are they. Nobody got arrested yet. So when. I think I mentioned that it is not so easy for us to do all these things and an inspector cannot be do even they are honest and the reason is why I'm saying all these the reason is 10% of our parliament member own group of government factories so our legislator is our factory owners we have like 300 members at the parliament 10% of who own group of garment factory and rest their relatives. So it is a whole bunch of them. We are just like outsider from the country who try to make changes there. But we didn't stop. We, could, we, we didn't stop because there was a support from international group. There is an international solidarity that helps us to keep doing work. And we didn't stop because we have commitment to 
uh, make changing. And I didn't stop because I really have a commitment to the workers. I don't want anyone go through the same way I went to. So here is my call, why I'm here. As I said, I wanted to connect you and together we need to make changes. So first call to put pressure on all these companies who didn't sign this accord. I think I was able to make the point why it is needed and why not alliance, why should be the accord. And also uh, go to this company and tell them to pay full and fair compensation to the workers. The company like Children Place, Loblo, Fairweather, um, the company uh, Sears Canada, Walmart Canada, they owe full and fair, fair compensation to the workers. Except Loblo, none of them even ready to discuss on this. And Loblo, they didn't tell how much they're going to pay, even they don't want it to give it name as a um, uh, compensation because if this is compensation then obligations come so they don't they are not ready to take that obligations but still we need to put pressure on them uh, in other hand I think it is a high time to talk about the increase the price not to the consumers to the product they are sourcing from my country because if this company add few cents more with the garment they are sourcing that can make sure our workers to have a uh, mini living wage. So few cents, I know for consumers it's, n it's not a big deal, but you know, I will say the company should pay because they are having majority of the profit of this business out of this, you know, using these human faces. So it is high time for them to contribute. So this is three, third is that, sorry, fourth is that uh, I think um, I wanted to make a point that the Canadian government giving a trade privilege to Bangladesh, which has mean that Bangladeshi garment or apparel can export to US without tariff. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm so lost. To Canada, Bangladeshi apparel can, to, can export to the Canada without tariff, which is great. That creates jobs, but it is non-conditional, unconditional. It doesn't have any condition, it's free. Anyone can export it, okay? And we want this conditional. So, and why? The US have their trade privilege for Bangladesh. The European Union has trade privilege for Bangladesh. All of them conditional and conditions are the country who wanted to have this privilege, they have to comply with domestic level law, the country level law, ILO core conventions and all the international labor standards and Canada doesn't have that. And the US government just suspended their GSP because our government has failed to comply with all conditions they has given. It is suspended, not revoked. They have given a notion that the country have to change these, these, these areas, then they will able to get back this uh, trade privilege. And the notions are among many, First one is to open the door to get res uh, union registration. My, I mean, the workers should have uh, should be free to exercise their union. So when I gave a, a statistic to having a 60 or less than 100 union register, you know, 100 union real union, 60 of them registered just last six months. When US, US has threatened to suspend this GSP, or when they suspend it, so the pressure works. We got our registration status back after they suspend their GSP. That has happened in August. Again, pressure really helps. The government, it has says that all the charges they brought against us and all, uh, you know, against other labor leaders have to be dropped. Those haven't dropped yet, but the government publicly says they're going to drop all those. So it is helping. So if Canada would have, and it also says that the country have to ensure that workers has their safe working place. It have to uh, review the labor law. The labor law has reviewed two, three months back, though there is a, some clauses which is anti-worker rights. We are working on that to put pressure onto the government to make changes. But in terms of safe working place, they at least uh, adopt a policy called um, the uh, action plan for yeah action plan for fire and building safety a 
at least they adopted that. So the pressure helps. But in other hand, the Canada GSP doesn't have any of these conditions. So you're giving the trade privilege, but the, as a citizen, as a union, you don't have any tools to put pressure onto the government uh, in Bangladesh that, or to the Canadian government that you should go to the Bangladeshi government and tell them they have to comply with these, these, these. So I think it's going to be a great tool if you can go to the, your government and tell them that this is how you can make changes or give a better workplace to the workers in Bangladesh. And I wanted to add the, you know, end with the point that many of the consumers after Tajreen and Rana Plaza, they were just stuck in a position that should I buy? I, I, sh sh I shouldn't buy. Okay, my clear answer is please buy. Not buying is not the solutions. We need these jobs, but we want these jobs with dignity. We want a living wage, we want a safe working place, and we want a union voice at the factories. That's it. And without your support, solidarity support, or as a pressure group support, we cannot have that. Because to having these and gain these or achieve these things in back home, it is pretty challenging when we have like one face, the, the factory owners and the government, they have really collusion and that, you know, that doesn't help us to achieve all those. Thank you. Thank you.